Well, uh, we're going to talk about uncommon and rare presentations of a Chiari malformation. But as I like to do, I'd like to sort of get everyone up to speed, if you will, on uh, the normal anatomy and what Chiari is. We have uh, ventricles where spinal fluid is produced inside our brain. There's a certain drainage system. These two large ventricles have to drain through these small openings into the third ventricle, a small tunnel into the fourth ventricle, where then they get out around the surface of the brain. And this area will be important. Here's another look at it from these beautiful drawings by Dr. Netter. Inside those fluid pockets, we have blood vessels. And with each heartbeat, spinal fluid is created. It needs to flow in this direction. When it gets to what we call the fourth ventricle, it has to get out through two side openings at this level, and also this opening here into this fluid pocket. And this fluid pocket is called a cistern, and it's called a cisterna magna. And then it can circulate around the brain, cushion the brain, and it gets absorbed back into the large veins to get back to the heart. So this is a second circulatory system that we were not taught of in grade school. We all know the cardiac circulation, but this is locked to the cardiac circulation. It has to happen with each heartbeat, and it's happening with us right now. So now let's focus on the Chiari problem. This is a normal slide from the Barrow Neurologic Institute, beautiful slide. Back of the head is here. This is from here to here is the hole at the bottom of the skull. This is the cerebellum. These are the tonsils. This is that opening. And the fluid needs to flow in to get out, if you will, into this space. If you look from behind, you see the cerebellum and these nubbins kind of hanging underneath it of cerebellar tissue that someone a long time ago called tonsils. So they're the cerebellar tonsils. These are important vertebral arteries that feed the brain. This is one of the branch of those vertebral arteries that feed the brain stem, the medulla, a critical area. This is the spinal cord. You were just hearing about C2 occipital neuralgia in this area, these nerves here. So that's the anatomy. What about the Chiari malformation? Well, this is, this is the modern definition. It was one article back in 1985. There were 82 subjects without any anomaly uh, malformation or without increased brain pressure. And there are frankly only 13 patients with Chiari malformation. They analyzed these patients and drew this drawing. Uh, this is their summary drawing, if you will. So again, this is a side view of the area we're talking about. This is the hole at the bottom of the skull from here to here, the cerebellum, the tonsils, and the spinal cord heading down this way. So Chiari is measured by drawing a line from the narrowest point here to here downward. What this article defined is that it normal if you're at up to three millimeters, but there's a borderline Chiari from three to five. Here the, the physician needs to make some judgments. Do the symptoms fit? But this is the standard, if you will, rough standard, I would call it, that if it's five millimeters or more, you can call it the Chiari malformation. So let's look at some scans. Here's the bone at the base of the skull, the back of the skull, draw a line from here to here. That's the hole at the bottom of the skull. These tonsils are in a nice position. There's a nice cisterna magna to handle the fluid flow. 
This person now is hanging down. The tonsils are hanging down, probably seven or eight millimeters in this case. There's really no fluid cistern here. So this is someone that presented with Chiari symptoms. Chiari can get worse with the repeated pulsations and it can stretch the medulla and compress it. So this is a tight um, region at the base of the skull, upper neck. This is even worse. This medulla has become very long. The tonsils are goosing it, if you will, from behind. They're hanging down the cervical one. The brainstem is being nudged against this bone. And we have to realize that this person is doing living activities, daily activities. This periodically can get tighter, depending on movement. This is a cross section through that in the same patient, stuffed with neurologic tissue. These are the tonsils. This is the brain stem. Here's a front shot of the tons tonsil on the left was greater than on the right, but really shoved down, if you will, into the upper cervical canal. And here's an even more severe situation. Tonsils are pointy. They're hanging all the way down. They're stuffed. They're down to C2. The brain stem is being goosed. So what does that cause? The pathophysiology um, in Chiari, and here's again a severe Chiari, herniated tonsils, fluid developing in the spinal cord called a syrinx. So one of the key pathologies or pathophysiologies is blocking or obstruction. It obstructs spinal fluid flow in this area. But it also compresses and deforms the uh, brain stem and upper spinal cord and it can lead to the development of syrinx. This is a patient that had uh, died um, from a pulmonary embolus, uh, reported in 96. She's 60 years old. She was known to have Chiari malformation and syringomyelia. And the family allowed an autopsy to look at the brain in detail. The right tonsil was the one that was causing the marked obstruction. The position of the left was normal. But the bottom line is within the tissue, these relay centers that we call nuclei within the brainstem uh, were undeveloped or uh, atrophic. They were hypoplastic. They just weren't healthy looking. There were fiber tracts that had um, inflammation or scarring, if you will, and loss of the shielding around those fibers. Just like your electric wire needs to have shielding, so do our nerves. They have shielding, it's called myelin, and so there was loss of that. In particular, there was loss of shielding around the corticospinal tract, which is the tracts that we use to move our arms, legs, walk, and basically move. And then the nuclei inside also showed their anatomy. They just weren't wired like others, or they had lost their natural wiring, if you will. And obviously, these neurologic changes are going to cause symptoms. So what are those symptoms? Um, and today, I'm going to talk about the uncommon and rare. The definition of what is common, uncommon, and rare is a general definition. It's like you would use with other things. Well, that's pretty common. I see it quite often. That's uncommon. I'm not too surprised. Oh, that's rare. There aren't specific numbers. Or let me put it another way. There are numbers. Here's our, our numbers in 265 patients published in 2004. And we wanted to see uh, what were the symptoms that at least 50% of this group had. So uh, there are some numbers, but there are other studies. They're going to have a somewhat different uh, group. And I won't read them all, but you can see certainly headache, dizziness uh, are very common or were very common in our study. Difficulty sleeping is common, was common, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily related to Chiari because a lot of people had difficulty sleep, sleeping. So I'm going to go down through some of the... Uh, more common symptoms so we can understand that, and I'll be brief. As we most realize, headache is the most common. It's usually at the back of the head, suboccipital. It tends to radiate to the forehead. 
It often feels like a pressure and it can feel as though it's explosive or an explosion. So it's worse when we sing, when we laugh, when we cheer, when we look up at the upper kitchen cabinets, we crowd that area even more and we can get headache. Chiari patients can get headache. They'll often tell me, well, I have my daughter do that or I stand back and look up at the upper cabinets. So what do folks say? They say, it feels like a severe pressure in my head and neck. Feels like my head will explode. Feels like someone is blowing up a balloon in my head, like my head will pop off. Visual symptoms are common. These often are blurred vision, bright lights bothering their eyes, or a jumpiness of the eyes called nystagmus. Dizziness, vertigo, ringing in the ears, decreased hearing. The Chiari is down in this area of the brain stem, and it can affect some of the functions of these nerves, like the eighth nerve going to the, uh, the ear. The lower cranial nerves, in particular the glossopharyngeal nerve right here in our throat, can lead to dysphagia, hoarseness, uh, dysarthria, numbness of the tongue, again, being compressed by the Chiari. The wires and the nerve centers aren't working well. If um, the, of course, the long fibers, here are the motor fibers, our control of arms and legs, and they, of course, have to run in the brain stem itself so people can complain of weakness, numbness or tingling in the arms or legs, or in coordination, which can also be in part due to the cerebellar function. And uh, also relatively common is nausea. Vomiting can occur, and in some patients, abdominal pain. And sure enough, the vomiting center is just underneath the tonsils, and they, it obviously gets compressed and dysfunctional. Um, and thinking, you know, people talk about it as brain fog. Uh, it's a deficit in executive function, if you will. Our working memory can be affected. Finding the right words. The daughter or the son will say, Mom, what did you say? A mixing up, a jumbling or a slurring of words. And it's not unusual for uh, folks with Chiari malformation to have difficulty doing two or three things at the same time, like many of us try to do. It's called multitasking. So let's get to the heart of this. What are uncommon and rare? It's important to think about these because it helps us recognize uh, who may have Chiari or not. Visual symptoms such as strabismus, where the eyes don't line up, here's a normal uh, situation, an esotropia or an exotropia, and these are hypertropias, if you will. The eyes are not lined up. Or there can be weakness looking to the side, um, to the right or left from the sixth nerve. Or there can be a, a fluttering, if you will, of the eyelids. Chiari can cause these symptoms. Other things can as well, of course. Numbness in the face is actually not uncommon. Um, and in the clinic, sometimes you, they notice it because you're testing on both sides. But a lot of folks, I think, don't, don't think, realize that what's called trigeminal neuralgia, which is a bad facial pain that comes in spasms, can be due to Chiari. Now, the fifth nerve is way up high. Chiari is down here. It's believed, and there's some scans to show, that as this area stretches down, there's some pulling and tugging of some of these nerves that could be the cause. There's facial weakness. The facial nerve is right here. And inducible means if Somebody might turn their head to the left, and there's a case reported on this, and the face gets weaker. They're stretching one nerve in that position. And in some people, the face will twitch on one side or the other. Again, these are less common symptoms. Pain in the deep throat from the glossopharyngeal uh, effects um, can occur uh, this person had a Chiari decompression and was pain-free 30 weeks after operation from this uh, bad pain. This is rare. Um, 
There are only one or two cases in the literature. Um, and in this group, they found a Chiari case. And the bottom line is that the back of the throat has this continuous irritating twitching that can occur night and day. And again, it's a Chiari, in a few people, this can be a Chiari related problem. Breathing issues, uh, poor sleep, sleep disorder, breathe, uh, breathing, breathing that's not rhythmic in nature. Some folks with actually sleep apnea that's due to Chiari. These are all the breathing centers that are in, these are in the medulla, the area that's gonna be compressed by the Chiari malformation. There being a few cases of respiratory arrest or failure because of compression of these um, um, breathing centers. And then there can be cardiac effects. Um, of course, fainting, which we'll talk about, can be due to uh, other, another mechanism, but it can be a fainting spell due to um, cardiac uh, dysrhythmia. Uh, basically, the cardiac centers, I didn't put a detail, but the cardiac centers are in the medulla. All of a sudden, your heart starts racing for no reason, compression of the medulla by Chiari. Or a couple of cases reported came in with episodes of very high blood pressures, 230 over 110, 210 over 115, and another patient were found to have Chiari malformation. Surgery was done, and these were resolved. And there are... Uh, mood symptoms. Now, we, I think we understand that there can be cognitive issues, problems with memory, getting words out, st structuring your thoughts, but actually mood can be affected. Anxiety and depression are not uncommon, but less common is difficulty expressing a person's emotion and difficulty regulating their behavior. Um, this is part of the cerebellum, it's believed. Um, so the, in the term or the condition is called the cerebellar cognitive affective syndrome. Uh, we'll touch on that a little more. Well, here it is right now. New work is showing, you know, when, when I grew up, the cerebellum was basically a coordination, um, coordination arms and legs, visual function, et cetera, et cetera. Now, especially in the back lower part of the cerebellum that's being mapped out of here, there are higher order cognitive functions that reside within the most inferior posterior and lateral parts of the cerebellum. Fortunately, not the tonsils themselves. And these have effects up into the frontal brain, if you will. And then unusual also from Chiari malformation are hormonal dysfunctions, endocrine dysfunctions. Here's a Chiari malformation. And all of us that see folks need to take a look at the pituitary. This is what's called an empty cell of the pituitary is compressed. And that itself could be a cause of this. But it seems like even in some folks with normal pituitaries, they can present with these findings. Again, these are uncommon. And here's a very rare syndrome um, that I know of. There's only one case that's been reported. Dr. Rakate, a Chiari surgeon, uh, reported it back in 99. There was brainstem dysfunction in Chiari malformation that, per, per, I'm sorry, presented in profound hypoglycemia. This person had uh, Chiari, uh, severe Chiari malformation and was improved following surgery. So an unusual presentation. These are some of the most interesting, and uh, we have to keep an eye out uh, for these, what are called paroxysms. A paroxysm is a sudden violent expression of emotion or an activity. So I'm gonna go over just a few of these paroxysms. Syncope we've already touched on. It can be cardiac, in other words, fainting. Chiari folks can faint. It's not real common, but it's not unusual. Um, and it could be cardiac, but it could also be basically our consciousness centers. This is what keeps us awake. Uh, this uh, reticular activating system that runs through the brain stem, if you will. So if this is compressed, somebody can pass out. 
these are unusual and uh, they're cerebellar fits. They're quite frightening. They've been described uh, primarily in children, uh, 13 uh, with pegged cerebellar tonsils, herniated below the foramen magnum. In other words, pegged, they were quite tight. Presented with this sudden spell, the child might arch, stop breathing. It's very frightening. But fortunately in 15, 20 seconds, it tends to settle. Um, and it's again, due to Chiari um, causing compression of the, uh, of the brain stem and uh, affects breathing as well. Now these, this condition also very rare that I know of, but it could be a little more common and we're just not recognizing. There are two cases clearly defined in the literature of paroxysmal rage fits. This is a two and a half year old presented with several month history of rage episodes. He would suddenly without warning become extremely irritable, upsetting furniture and biting and kicking those around him, including his parents. He had, and I'll give you the outcome here in a minute. Let me describe the eight year old girl. She presented with a six month history of episodic violent behavior in which she would run, scream, be uncontrollable, kick and punch people around her. Um, and sometimes these episodes could last most of the day until she was finally exhausted. Neurosurgeon that saw these two children did Chiari surgery on both of the children and evaluated them uh, 12 months later for the boy and the boy 12 months after there were no further rage episodes. The eight year old girl also no further age rage episodes when he saw her six months after surgery and was now described as pleasant and engaging. So a very unusual manifestation of behavior and we have, have not previously considered the cerebellum that important in behavioral functions, but it clearly is. Um, so now, uh, summarizing a little bit. Now, what may be uncommon or rare may simply be uncommon or rare, that this doesn't occur as often as those other symptoms. However, at least in a few patients, there may be uncommon or rare because we're not recognizing that Chiari is the culprit. So the key message from the presentation is we at least need to be aware of these. There, most clinicians recognize the uncommon, but the rare things like facial nerve palsy, paroxysmal rage are so uncommon that those probably aren't at top of the mind when we um, see folks. So uh, that was the clear mission, if you will, of the presentation is just to raise awareness that there are these other symptoms out there. I do want to just finish up with uh, just one case of a surgical outcome to talk to see what it tells us really about Chiari malformation. And this would be almost another presentation in and of itself. Now, granted, this is a severe case. She's in her early 20s. Okay very happy pons of the brainstem. This upper part of the cerebellum is fine. The lower spinal cord is, is fine. This is markedly disrupted. The tonsils are pointed, shoved, pegged, if you will. Here's C2, so they're close. I'm sorry, here's C1, they're close to C2. This is the vital, these are the vital centers. Everything tracking up and down uh, arms, uh, legs, feeling, et cetera, balance is, has to pass through here. Cardiac centers, breathing centers, cranial nerve centers are there. It is twisted, it is compressed, it is bulging out here because of this compression. So I did her surgery and uh, have her follow-up scan a year after surgery. Normal brain sense normal looking spinal cord, that bunching up of tissue here flattened into much more normal. No wonder this uh, lady can be better. With time, a lot of this can heal, not everything in everyone. 
it tells us that Chiari is active. It's a dynamic disease. With each pulsation over our lives, this worsens. Coughing and sneezing, it's going to block this even tighter. Your head's going to explode, and um, it's going to worsen the, the situation. So fortunately, in modern days, with all our technology and the techniques in the surgical suite, we can get many folks from this situation to this situation and resume uh, a much more natural life. Um, so I thank you for allowing uh, to present, and I believe I'll take questions through the, um, through the chat area. Thank you.